And uh, look there in your Bibles, if you would, Matthew chapter 5. And we'll begin verse in, uh, reading in verse number 13. Let's all stand together, shall we? For the reading of the Word of God, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13. The Bible says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Now, my daddy used to say that about folks that were lazy, that they were good for nothing. He had a low tolerance for lazy people. And so his famous statement, whenever he'd run across somebody like that, he'd say, they're good for nothing. They ain't worth the powder it take to blow them up. Well, that's pretty sorry when you're not worth the powder it take to blow you up. Uh, but the Bible says here that you're a good-for-nothing Christian if you lost your savor. And the Bible compares the born-again believer to salt. And so if the salt has lost its savor, good-for-nothing, cast out, I believe many times the Lord takes people to heaven prematurely because maybe they've crossed the line with him. It goes on and says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's about for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time we can spend together blessing the children's service. Help those youngins to have a full understanding of what it means to be saved. To know they are safe and secure from the consequences of sin. To know that they can be assured of a home in heaven. Thank you for that hope. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. You all can be seated. The Bible says, ye are salt. He could have said, you're the flour. He could have said, you're sugar. He could have said, you're the spice. But he says, you're salt. Why would the Bible say, you're salt? Well, I'm glad you asked me. I'm going to tell you why, because <laughs> salt is essential to your body's health. Your body's cells must have salt in order to live, in order to function, and in order to work. you got to have salt. <laughs> There's more than 14,000 uses for salt. Salt is used as a seasoning for food. It's used to melt snow. It's also used to make ice cream. Amen? Salt is used by meat packers and by chemical companies. And it's also used to make ice cream. Yeah. Salt is used by hide and leather processors, and it's used by food processors. And they also use it to make ice cream. There you go. Yeah. Salt is used to make glass and soap and rayon and washing detergents. And believe it or not, they also use it to make ice cream. There you go. Hey, soap is used to make paper. It's used to purify water. It's used to preserve food. And it's also used to make ice cream. That's right. Salt is used to kill germs. So therefore, you need to eat your ice cream. Amen. So you boys and girls that are in here need to tell mom and dad, I got to have ice cream to kill germs. The preacher said that. That's what they use it for. It's also used to hold firm the materials used to build roads. It has many uses. But you know, you would die without salt, just like this world would die and go to hell if it weren't for some separated, salty, soul and serving saints for the Savior. Man, we got to have salt. Thank God for salty, born-again believers. Amen? Oh, man. Among many peoples today, salt is still used as a sign of honor. It's used as a sign of friendship. It's used as hospitality. In fact, salt was the chief economic product of the ancient world. In fact, it was so scarce, it was so precious that it was used as money. And Caesar's soldiers received part of their pay in salt. And it is from this we get the word salary. It comes from that time. And in fact, the term not worth his salt meant a guy did not earn his wages. It comes back from those days. Salt is used over 46 times in the scripture. The Bible says in Job 6.6, 6, Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Well, I'm here to tell you no. Can you imagine McDonald's french fries without salt? Can you imagine steak without salt? Can you imagine hamburgers without salt? Can you imagine elk without salt? Hey, man, got to have salt. Man, can you imagine that? Hey, I got to have salt to keep my blood pressure up. Hey, man, salt. 
Man, it's essential. You got to have salt. And you die without salt. And the Bible says you're the salt. Now, salt makes things better. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, those salty Christians, they make the workplace better. Salty Christians, they make United States of America better. Huh? Salty Christians, and you know, they're the ones that stop and help somebody that's broken down alongside the road, and they'll pull over. There's somebody that sees somebody struggling with the load and will stop and help them. Um, that salty Christian, that's that one that can create an atmosphere, lift the spirits. They miss you when you're not at work. Where were you at? Man, it's just like something's not right when you're not there. That's, that's that salt. We, we make things better. Uh, they're the ones that give in whenever that there's a long line and everybody's making a rush for the doors of the buffet after Sunday morning church. And they're the ones that stop, hold the door, let somebody else maybe go in ahead of them. They might give in at a, at a yield at a stop sign. That's a salty Christian. They're like that. You know, uh, I remember a story of Brother Howes, my pastor, who's going home to be with the Lord. And Brother Howes was preaching a conference. And after the conference was over, he went to get a bite for lunch. Whenever he did, he went to a restaurant and he was just going to order a simple sandwich, cup of soup or cup of coffee. And, and he went in there and sat down and the waitress didn't show up for the longest. And there was the table was bare and she come up in a foul mood. She came up with her pad and paper. What do you want? He says, well, ma'am, how about a glass of water, and maybe some silverware and a menu? Oh, she huffed. He said, thank you, ma'am. She turned, walked away in a huff, come back, threw it down there on the table. And he said, thank you, ma'am. She says, is that all you can say? Thank you, ma'am, please, ma'am, 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 ma'am. He said, yes, ma'am. She turned and walked away. He's trying to lift her spirits, realizing she's having a bad day. If this lady's working off tip, she's going to be broke, flat, busted. So she come back to finally get his order. You know what you want? He said, yes, ma'am, I'd like to have a bowl of soup. I'd like to have a cup of coffee. Fine. She turned, went away. When she brought it back to the table, she set it down so abruptly that it spilt there on the table, and she never come back to check on it. Well, when it's time to leave, he reached in his pocket, turned to page number 20, got a gospel tract out of his pocket, which I'm sure all your members carry, Brother Wise. I'm sure anybody that loves the Lord is a salty Christian. Why, man, they're going to be carrying the gospel gun, man. They're going to be having a gospel track to, you know, let people know because, man, the Bible commands us to go with the gospel. I'm sure every Sunday school teacher here is loaded down with gospel tracks. I bet you ever deacon and anybody that's got a position, I bet their glove boxes are full of tracks. I bet you've left them so many places in the community. People's like, they see that picture up otherwise and they just say, oh, Lord, pray for that. No, they say, they see that picture, and they say, oh, yeah, that Unity Baptist Church, man, we get them all the time. I was in the town one time, they had a contest to see who could get the most of the tracks from the, that particular soul-winning church in town. And one waitress says, I got 12 of them. Now, you know, that's saying something. Would anybody around here, if I went in a restaurant and handed them a track, would they say, well, I ain't never seen one of them before. Ooh. Hey, them folks that are salt, man. They carry them all the time, pass them out everywhere they go. Yeah, them salty Christians. He took that gospel tract, took that $20 bill, laid it right in there, left it on the table. $20 tip for that kind of service. Are you out of your mind? He's paid the bill. He's on his way out. That waitress is chasing him down. Sir, 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 you left this on the table, assuming that he could not have left $20 for her. And she said, ma'am, don't they believe in tipping around here? Well, she broke. She couldn't believe it. She'd been so ugly, so mean, so nasty, and he leaves a $20 bill. And he said, ma'am, I just perceive that you're having a tough time. See, whenever that something's broken, it doesn't run right. When something's busted, 
It doesn't work right. He figured out something's happened in her life. She's just had a crisis. She's just had uh, bad news. Maybe she found out that her husband was cheating on her. Maybe she found out that her mama uh, was dying of cancer. Maybe a best friend has died, and she's going through a tough time. And so he decided to make things better, left her a $20 bill, and she began to break and cry. And he said, ma'am, I got the answer for you. And he introduced her to Jesus Christ. Told her how she could get saved right there in the front of the restaurant. She bowed her head and asked Jesus to save her soul. Oh, thank God for some salty, separated, soul winning, serving saints for the Savior. Woo-hoo, they make things better. You run across somebody's like that, they're mean and nasty. I guarantee you, they're not running right. I guarantee you, they're broke. Something has happened. They've been hurt. Salty Christians make things better. Salty Christians have preserved this nation. This nation is what it is today because it was built and founded upon Christian principles, upon the Bible, upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Not Allah, not Hare Krishna, not any other false god, not Buddha. Jesus Christ. The Bible. This nation. Founded upon that. They're trying to rewrite the history books because they don't want you to know what we were built upon. See, you go to Washington, D.C., and there's scripture verses everywhere. Go to the Capitol building, and there's, I think, nine, six to nine different giant murals painted, and you'll see each and every one of them, they're praying. They're praying. They're going to have to deface Washington to try to erase what this country is built upon. They don't want you to know that Pocahontas was the first convert. They want you to think that Pocahontas converted John Smith over to her polytheism and many gods, but that's not true. She got saved. He wrote about it in his articles. His greatest desire was she'd come to know Christ as her Savior. She got saved, changed her name to Rebecca, was baptized, took a tour overseas, but they're not going to tell you that. They're not going to tell your kids in the public school that. Yeah, because they don't want you to know the truth. Very hush up. Hey, the United, it's called the American dream. Not the Russian dream. Not the Filipino dream. Not the China dream. It's the American dream. Why? Because we were founded upon Christianity, upon the Word of God. That's the reason why the United States of America is the greatest nation. That's the reason why one of the youngest, but one of the strongest and greatest. Does it surprise you? Salt, thank God for salty, separated, soul winning, serving saints for the Savior. He said, you're the salt. I hope that you're making things better. Now, the Bible also says that ye are the light of the world. And so, I've got a little visual aid I want to share with you here this morning to illustrate that point. The Bible says, ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, I've got a light bulb here and a lamp. I've got a container of water, which represents the world. I've got a short-circuited wire from this cord down in the water. I've got some electricity. And... Most importantly, a plastic spoon. Now, do not try this at home. You must be a highly skilled, professionally trained electrical engineer, of which I am not. But nonetheless, I'm going to show you how this works. Okay. Now, let's see. I've got some salt here. The Bible says, you're the light of the world. Got this salt Without salt in the world, it is dark. And New Guinea's been in darkness for a long time. Huh? There's countries that were closed to the gospel. They've been in darkness because there is no salt. Because you can't have light without salt. I'm going to show you. There'll be no light without salt. I'm going to plug this wire. It's short-circuited right here. And I need a volunteer to come put their finger in the water to make sure this is powered up. And I see those 
that have no idea, that would not be a good thing to do. <laughs> no, you don't want to do this. This could do severe damage to your person. So we do not want to do that, okay? But I'm going to stick this spoon in here. Just seeing if you're paying attention. All right, now watch this. No salt in the world during darkness. He said, hey, I want you to let your light shine. So let's put some salt inside a lost and dying world to get some light because they need to see. So we'll put some salt in there. Yes, indeed. Get just a little bit more here. Hope this. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, a little bit of salt. We got a little bit of light. (laughs) God says, let your light shine. We sing that song, this the light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Sing, this the light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Now, we're supposed to let our light shine to help a lost and dying world see. Oh, yeah. Let's see if we get some more born-again believers in a lost and dying world. What happens? Let's put some more. Oh, yeah, it gets brighter. Man, if we get some more soul winners out on the street, get some more buses, get some more people saved, oh, man, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's getting brighter. And so God says, man, I need some light. More the more separated, salty, soul winning, serving saints for the Savior. You put in a lost and dying world. And whoa, buddy, it's getting bright. Hey, that's what we need today. That's the answer for America. The problem is our light's going out. We've lost our savor. Christians are refusing to vote. How stupid, how insane for us not to vote. Not to vote is to vote. Man, we don't vote. We don't stand up for truth and for right. Man, no wonder all the other isms and schisms and cults are taking over. No wonder we're beginning to be a minority. Our light's going out. What we need today is more born-again believers to let their light shine. Oh, yeah. Man, I think God says, I need a light. He said, I need a light in your place of work. I need a light at your family reunion. I need a light in your community. I need a light in your county. God says, I need a light. And so he sent you. I wonder, are you letting your light shine? God said, I need a light in the Philippines. It's dark over there. They have no no witness. And so what happened? Missionary Rick Martin, he goes to the Philippines. Little bitty skinny fellow, basketball under his arms. Goes over there, plays basketball with about eight boys. After they play ball, they thought he was Michael Jordan. Because, <laughs> you know, they're short of stature over there. He wasn't much taller, but he's a pretty good ball player. He sat them boys down, said, if you die today, you know you go to heaven? No, we don't know. Hope so, maybe so, think so. How about you today? If I came down and pointed at you and said, if you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven? What would your answer be? Maybe. I think so. I hope so. I know so. What's your answer? If you say you know so, well, then how do you know you're going to heaven? Those boys didn't know. And if you don't know, you're in the best place you could be to get that settled, get it cared for. They didn't know. He said, let me show you. And he pulled out his New Testament, and he gave them God's simple plan of salvation. Woo! He let his light shine. Oh, man. All eight of them boys got saved. Now, about 35 years later, you go to the Philippines, the city of Iloilo, you'll see a massive church covering an entire city block it runs between three and four thousand any given weekend they have seen hundreds of thousands of people saved they got five to six hundred students in their bible college at any given time started over 600 churches in the philippines god said i need a light and he sent missionary rick martin to let his light shine so the filipino people could see how that you can't get to heaven by working your way there you can't get to heaven because you're a church member you can't get to heaven because you're taking communion you can't get to heaven because you put money in the offering you're not going to heaven because you got baptized no it's through jesus christ he preached jesus man they got saved wow god said i need a light god said i need a light are you letting your light shine she was a single lady found out of a great need for the gospel in the land of the of uh, new guinea she went over there and god used that single lady to do a phenomenal thing down the Brazza river was a tribe of the most fierce headhunters cannibals of all time her name was margaret stringer you get a chance to read her book from cannibalism to christianity 
an unbelievable story about how a single lady missionary went through some perilous events, floated down the Brazza River, ate things you and I wouldn't step on, did things that you and I would never dream of doing in order to get there. And they tried to tell her, don't go. You, many, of other, many have tried and they have died. She says, I know God wants me to do this. And she persuaded somebody to take her. She went. Whenever they got to the village, she immediately, they captured her. And she thought she was going to die. But through a series of events that took place, they spared her life for some strange reason. She learned their language. She began to present the gospel to them. And over several weeks of teaching and training, the chief got saved, and over 70% of the village got saved. And no longer are they the most fierce, dreaded tribe. No longer are they cannibals. No longer, she said, if they would see Jesus, if they had Jesus, they'd get saved, and they wouldn't be eating people, and they wouldn't be killing folks, and they wouldn't be doing that. And God used Margaret to let her light shine to see almost an entire tribe get saved. Oh, thank God for that salty, separated, soul-winning, serving saint for the Savior. She made a difference. Oh, God wants you to let your light shine. Amen? Oh, I'm telling you, on the tombstone of J. Frank Norris, it said, I would do anything to keep a man out of hell. What are you doing to keep your family out of hell? What are you doing to keep your neighbors out of hell? What are you doing to keep this community out? out of hell oh yeah let's let our light shine let's not lose our savor let's make a difference and have a testimony that other people can say there's something different about them folks down there at unity there's something different about that fellow i work with man he doesn't cuss and fuss and he doesn't drink and smoke dope and be stupid and wild and crazy man this fellow's got a good spirit a good attitude he's got something that i don't have i wish i had it yeah how about you Oh, let's let our light shine. Because <laughs> you'll never have light without salt. Because those people need to see. For me, I saw the light January 10th, 1971. I was a seven-year-old, red-headed, freckle-faced boy. Back when I had hair, it was red. Turned colors and turned loose. God don't put marble tops on cheap furniture. Amen. And preachers preaching about heaven and about hell. And I needed to see the fact that I was a lost sinner because nobody ever goes to heaven until they can see I'm lost headed for hell. Those kids down there in that junior church deserve to go to hell. You deserve to go to hell. I deserve to go to hell. Now that's bad. That's strong. And that's tough to take. Because some of them are thinking, I want you to know my grandbaby's down there. Well, I want you to know that mine's in the nursery. And I want you to know that he's a sinner because he's already learned how to lie because he screams, acts like he's dying, and when you pick him up, ah. We're born sinners. That's why Jesus died, because we're headed for hell. So don't get all upset because if you don't think you deserve hell, you're not going to hit heaven. Nobody goes to heaven until they realize I'm a sinner and I deserve hell. And it clicked in my head, preacher. I was like, man, I understood that. And I began to weep and cry because I didn't want to die and go to hell. And the preacher said, if you'd like to know for sure that you go to heaven, why don't you leave your seat, come down to the front during the invitation. Man, I couldn't get down to the altar quick enough. The preacher's wife opened up a little red New Testament, showed me through God's simple plan of salvation down the Romans road. She said, Kevin, you understand you're a sinner? I said, yes, ma'am. Tears running down my face. I thought of all the terrible things that I had done. All the wicked life that I had lived at the age of seven. Man, I was addicted to drugs. I was drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Anytime the doors was open, I was drugged. Anyway, just kidding. I, what had I done? Lied, disobeyed. I never killed anybody, never robbed a bank. But I was a sinner. Because of that sin, I deserved to go to hell. She said, Kevin, you believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin? Yes. You believe if you asked Jesus to save you, he would? My eyes was open that day. And that day, whenever I knelt down and called upon Jesus and asked him to save my soul and poured my heart out to God, whoo, I got up like, whoo, a thousand pounds. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Man, I'll never forget that day. That 
the most important event that ever took place in my life, and I got saved. Man, I saw the light. It just opened up, and I understood. Do you have that moment? Do you remember when you got saved? How do I know I'm saved? You'll remember it. It's not going to be, well, Mom said that I got saved. Wrong answer. How do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I was... Got ba- Wrong answer. Well, uh, how do you know you're saved? Well, the, the preacher said he looked in the records, and they got a record whenever that I got uh, uh, baptized and, and everything. Wrong answer. No, no, you better know that you're saved. You, it's a personal decision, and you will remember the most important event in your life when you were under conviction of your sin, saw yourself going to hell, and put your faith and trust in Jesus. Oh, yeah, you'll have a memory of that event in your life. Let me encourage you today. You, you might not know the fine details. You might not even know the date, but you'll have a memory of it. My daddy didn't know the date. He didn't know some of the things, but he said, Kevin, I'll never forget that time. I remember that moment. You'll remember it. You'll know it. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I just don't know. I'm uncertain. I'm unsure. Then why don't you let us help you get it settled? Huh? Yeah. Don't live in doubt any longer. Get it settled. If you're here today and you said, Preacher, I'm saved, then I hope that I can encourage you this morning not to lose your savor, but to make things better. Help preserve this country. It's Christians that's going to do it. And then... Why don't you decide to let your light shine to help a lost and down world see they need Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.